And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. When they heard it, they were glad, promised to give him money, and he saw how he might conveniently betray him. Let us pray. Lord, again, it's already been good to be in this house this morning. Lord, we love you and praise you for that grace and love that you have showered upon us. We're thankful this morning to be able to be here together with your family. 
for the praise that's already taken place, for the instruction that's already taken place. We're thankful this morning now for just a few more moments in your word. Pray, Lord, that uh, as it goes out this morning, it would work on every heart that's here. Realizing, Lord, as Brother Henry said, we all stand in need. Lord, we come today, Lord, needing your word, needing your guidance, needing you. So help us, Lord, for whatever that need might be. And especially, Lord, if that need is salvation, I pray today, as the Holy Spirit works on the heart, that we would all be obedient. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, because of, of uh, Fifth Sunday, it's been a couple of weeks since we were in Mark. Just a quick reminder of where we're at. Uh, Wednesday, a, a Passion Week, about halfway through. Uh, we get Mark's account of Jesus being at Simon, uh, the leper's house at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, Mary brings in that alabaster box full of uh, uh, expensive oil, pure nard, and uh, she breaks the vessel. Instead of just getting a drop, she breaks the neck off the vessel and pours it out on Jesus, even on, on his feet, where she then dries it with her hair. And, and remember, it, it was expensive, uh, a year's wages, uh, probably a, an inheritance that she had inherited, maybe even her dowry, but something that was really special uh, for her. And it, Last uh, two weeks ago as we talked about that, the, the kind of thing we wanted you to take from that was remember that she understood and she did all that she could do. That's what she did in that act of, of worship. And, and during this act of, of wholehearted devotion, uh, there's something else going on that's the exact opposite. Going back in the text, uh, back up to verses 4 and 5, it said, Mark said, And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. We mentioned this that week, but I want to read it today instead of just mention it. John's Gospel, when John gives us this account, is what he says. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. So during this act of wholehearted devotion from Mary, who, who understood and did all she could do, there was at the same time a, a deep-seated corruption being acted out by Judas Iscariot. Uh, I love the fact that here in Mark 14, the Lord puts these back to back. You get Mary's act of love and devotion and understanding and doing all she can and giving what she gives right along with Judas Iscariot and his sinfulness and lustfulness and lack of worship and love for the Lord Jesus Christ back to back to give us two examples one good, one bad, one what you should do, one what you shouldn't do. And I, I love the fact that, that Mark here, according to the Holy Spirit and his leadership, puts these back to back for us. Now, again, Judas is a thief. John calls him out right there. He said he didn't do it because he cared for the poor. He did it because he was a thief. Judas loved the money. Money was his idol. We went over a little bit back earlier in Mark when we listed out the apostles of uh, Remember, uh, 12, he's the only one of the 12 that wasn't from Galilee. He, he's kind of the outsider, the non-Galilean. But as we'll see and we understand from our knowledge and what takes place, we know uh, that's not just the only thing that was different about Judas. Uh, he didn't have any care for the poor. It was all just a, a disguise to cover up his, uh, his own sinfulness and greed. <laughs> Judas is the definition of the picture of a true hypocrite. Now, in the text, you'll notice it said, and Judas Iscariot, then it described him, one of the twelve. And that's something you can't miss this morning. That's something that really should stand out to you. Remember, he's one of the twelve. There's only been twelve men that spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for three years of their life, witnessing, listening to, being part of, 
in an intimate, personal, loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Only 12 in the history of mankind, and Jesus Iscariot is one of them. As much as we love the Lord, as much as we want to be everything we can be, there ain't a person sitting in here that was one of the 12. And a person sitting in here that had that luxury, that had that grace, that blessing of being part of Jesus' life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week for almost 3 years. Jews was a friend and a companion of Jesus. He heard his teachings firsthand. He witnessed his miracles uh, uh, in real time. He was there for all those things that took place. And he was so convincing as one of the twelve that the other eleven never suspected him. As we'll get to as we're coming up, when, when Jesus announces, hey, one of you sitting here is going to betray me, they're all looking, they don't know. They're all asking. They're all one. It ain't like they all say, I knew it all along. <laughs> well, sorry. He didn't come from Galilee. He wasn't worth nothing anymore. I knew something was wrong with him. Never knew. Never knew. He had it all covered up. He had it all looking good on the outside. He said the right things. He dressed the right way. <laughs> he went to the right places. But there wasn't nothing right in here. Right. How many folks are like that today? Amen. Say the right things. Dress the right way. Go to the right places. Sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But it's not right there. Yeah. Not right there. Never was right there. Jews got involved with the twelve and with Jesus because he thought he might get something out of it. And he was getting some stuff out of it, profiting himself. He managed to get himself in charge of, as John says, the bag. Because as long as he held the bag, he could dip out of the bag, pilfer it, steal money. He was an idolater. He loved money more than he loved God. He loved something else besides God more than God and more than Jesus. And as he watched Mary in this act of love, Instead of seeing it as that act of love and devotion and worship, he saw it as a year's worth of wages that could have went in the bag. Wasted. That's the word he used. Why would you waste it? Boy, anything you ever do for Jesus is not a waste. Amen? Amen. Amen. But when it's not here, it's a waste. When it's not here, you just can't understand it. And so here it is. That, that act, that hey, I could have had that, kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. Now, remember back up in verse 1 of chapter 14 as we started this chapter. After two days was the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread, the chief priests and scribes saw how they might take him by craft. So as we started, we've got all this working behind the scenes. The chief priests, they're ready. You've got to take him. You've got to kill him. you got to get this done. Judas knows this. And then as we get to the text, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. So Judas, now I'm going to do it. He goes to the chief priests. We don't get the specifics here in Mark, but what we do get is this. When they heard it, they were glad, the chief priests, and promised to give him money because that's what he went for. Hey, I'll get you Jesus. What can I get in return? How much are you going to give me? We know, according to Scripture, as we'll get into it, they give him 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. Nothing close to what they could have sold the, the ointment for and put in the bag. 30 pieces of silver, by chance, also happens to be the exact amount that it costs to purchase a slave. Kind of fitting there that the amount you can purchase a slave is what they give Judas for betraying Jesus. So again, you got Mary who willingly and without hesitation gave up something worth a year's wages, possibly the most important thing she had, possibly again inheritance of dowry, something that was dear to her heart and she willingly without hesitation Gave it up in worship to Jesus. And now you got Judas, 
who willingly and without hesitation gives Jesus up for a much smaller amount of uh, 30 pieces of silver. Judas is scared. Now, we see this, and I want to bring this out this morning, an important issue that, that stays with us today. There are some who do not, I use the word Brad used in the message really good not long ago, continue to the end and are not saved. There are some who do not continue to the end and are not saved. Or maybe even better, who do not continue to the end because they're not yeah. saved. Yeah. Right. Again, they say the right things, do the right things, go to the right places, but it's not in here. I think the best illustration is, is, is the parable of the sower. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you want to flip over, you can. We went back through it in Mark chapter 4. You'll remember the parable of the sower. He goes and sows seeds, and, and, and you've got some that fell by the wayside, some that fell amongst the thorns, uh, uh, some that fell on good ground, and some that fell uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, stony ground. I won't go through the whole parable. What I do want to get to is when Jesus explains it. So if you want to look with us, it's Mark 4, starting in 14. Mark 4, starting in 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And then these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. And afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. So, you can take Jews, you can say, Maybe he's that definition of the thorny ground because uh, Jesus brings it right up and said, boy, the, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things <laughs> choke it out. Or, or, or maybe you could describe him as the stony ground. No root. Receive it with gladness. That was all good. And then when it really gets time, you realize there's nothing there that just dies and withers away. Let me tell you something. There's a whole lot more seeds falling by the wayside on stony ground and on thorny ground than there are on good ground. Amen. And Judas is the picture of it not falling on good ground. Because there are folks, there are folks who profess Jesus, but they don't possess Jesus. Right. Let me say that again. Yeah. There are folks who profess Jesus, but they don't possess Jesus. There's a difference in profession and possession. Yeah. A lot of folks professing Jesus, but they didn't ever possess Jesus. And that's a dangerous ground to be on, folks. Yeah. An unconverted believer. You say, well, I thought I was a believer, I was converted. No. An unconverted believer. There are a lot of folks that believe God, believe who Jesus is, but they don't ever repent of that sin and come into a personal relationship with Jesus, thereby changing their life. And it don't matter what they say or how good a show they put on, they're going to stand before God and they're going to give an answer and they're going to spend eternity in hell because they never turn their life over to Jesus. Unrepentant sinner. Oh, Jesus walked around every day. Nobody knew any different. They said, well, when did you just got saved? He just, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. When the Lord saves you, he changes. 
He set your eternity in heaven. Yeah. And I'll tell you this. If you look all over heaven this morning, you won't find Judas Iscariot. Right. But I can tell you where you can look for him. Yeah. In hell. Right. But when he took that last breath, when he hung himself, he lifted up his eyes and he was in torment. Right. For three years, Judas was intimately involved with Jesus and his ministry. And not one time did he ever take a step toward faith and repentance. For all of that time, for all that time he spent with Jesus, he wouldn't repent. And now, if we find ourselves in the text, he's about to betray Jesus. And even though he will feel remorse, he cannot <coughs> repent. He cannot repent. Reminds me of Esau. Remember what Hebrew says about Esau? Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meal sold his birthright. Well, Judas is scared who for 30 pieces of silver sold out the Savior. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. And then Hebrew says this about Esau. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Judas wouldn't repent, and then Judas couldn't repent. You know, the Bible wouldn't say, seek the Lord while he may be found, unless there was a time coming when he couldn't be found. Yeah. Today is the day of salvation. Seek the Lord while he may be found, because there's coming a day when he can't be found. The story of, of Judas is scary. It, it's a tragedy, but it's scary, folks. The implications are still real today. An idolater, that's all he was, an idolater who, despite being in the very presence of Jesus, in the very presence of the Savior, never gets saved. Looks the part, professes, but never possesses. Loves himself and his sins more than he loves God. How many people today walking around in the same situation as Judas is scary? I believe those are the folks that Jesus describes in Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The saddest words, the most damning words, the most horrible words anyone could ever hear for the Lord Jesus to look you in your eye and say, I never knew you. You professed me, but you didn't possess me. You said the right things. You put on a good show, but you never gave me your heart. You never turned from your sins, your wicked ways, and asked for repentance and a change in your life. And because of that, I pronounce this judgment on you. Depart from me. I don't know about you. That ain't what I want to hear. I want to hear welcome home. Yeah. How good and faithful service. Right. Even though I don't deserve it. Boy, that's what I want to hear. Yeah. While we stand, and these come with a verse of invitation this morning. Open the altar up. If you need to come this morning, we'd like to pray, we'd like to pray with you this morning.
to us and we'd love to have you. This altar's still open. We have preached a lot lately about the day of the Lord and the sounding of the trumpet and the shout of the archangel. Make no mistake, he's coming. Yeah. And the only thing that's going to matter when he comes is does he know you or does he not know you? Have you received him as Savior? Or have you just been professing? Yeah. We're going to leave here this morning if you can't say that He's truly your Savior and you're truly His child. Why don't we sing the last verse? <laughs> Jake, would you just mention?